Welcome to the SEMGRAP community. I am Tanya Jake. I'm your host, and I'm so glad you're here. We are having an event today where we're going to talk about DevSecOps, and we know I love this topic. In the chat, we have, and at this event and all of our events, we have a code of conduct of please don't be mean to each other or our host or our guest, um, which I feel is really easy. Um, and so, yes, this is being recorded because everyone always asks, and yes, 100%, you will get a copy. But I want to introduce my co-host and then my guest. Layla, can you introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Layla Arabian. As I mentioned, I work with Tanya here at SumGrep. I'm calling in from the SumGrep office today, and I'm super excited to be here. Awesome. And now my guest, because that's what everyone wants. Um, this, <laughs> this is Chloe Potsglan, and she's a security engineer, and she's working on security architecture and endpoint security. And... Um, Chloe, can you tell them a little bit about yourself? Yeah, for sure. Hey, everyone. Um, my name's Chloe. Super excited to be here. Uh, I met Tanya over the summer, actually, and she really graciously invited me to join all of you today. I'm super excited to be here, talk about all things DevSecOps, automation, CICD, what have you. Um, and basically, the impetus for the everything behind this presentation is I kind of was like, all right, I want to I want to sandbox this. I want to see what it will take to actually have like try like start out with threat modeling and come up with what would be an idealized pipeline using DevSecOps. And you know, for all things security, we have to have a fun witty title. So floating the goat gra grabs everyone's attention. And there is there is um some rhyme and reason to that title for sure. Uh should I go ahead and share my screen and jump into it? So yeah, floating the goat, how to use DevSecOps to secure OWASP web goats. So just as a high level overview, I'm gonna give a little bit more of an explanation of myself. Who am I? We're gonna go through some, just like a lot of definitions. What's web app security, CICDs, DevSecOps, cloud security, you know, just like really light topics that we're gonna breeze right through. And we're gonna go into what this idealized DevSecOps pipeline is gonna look like. We're gonna go, discuss and talk through security architecture and design, threat modeling, um, dynamic application security um, scanning, logging, and an automation server. We'll have a demo where we'll break down all those steps into piece by piece, and then we'll wrap up with questions, shout outs, resources, and what have you. So I also want to start out by saying that this is meant to be like a super high level talk, like super high level, one inch deep talk where we talk about like DevSecOps overall, best practices and some practical first steps for creating your own demo to pilot yourself. Um, and I also want to start out by saying like DevSecOps is, you know, this ongoing process of continuous integration and improvement to strive towards. There's not necessarily like a one size fits all. Um, there's a lot of great open source tools that we'll go through today. Um, and again, this list and everything I'm talking about isn't um, finite. There's so every day, tons of new tools, new trends, new processes, but this is what worked for me so far. And also this isn't, this is just a process that continue, can, you could continue iterating on. Um, but yeah, let's go ahead. So about myself, got my snazzy little headshot I have. So I'm a security architecture or sorry, rather I'm a security engineer at a media company. I have some experience in endpoint security, architecture, application security. I started my career at Deloitte. I have a couple degrees from Fordham. And on the side, I also teach intro to cybersecurity boot camps for savvy coders. And I also develop material for a plural site. All right. So let's jump into it. Um, Hear me out. We're going to go through a lot of really meaty topics um, at a high level. There's all these topics we could really dive more deeply in. It could be an entire course, an entire talk. But for the purpose of this, I, I want to set the stage on what we're talking about today. So what even is web application security? Um, so it's this idea of using software, hardware, and different methods to protect applications from external threats. Uh, I actually, when I met Tanya over the summer, she gave a keynote earlier that day, and I really loved her definition, where she said application security is every action you take towards ensuring that the software that you or someone else creates um, is secure. And I really like that idea. 
So basically, there has been a trend for the past few years of this idea of shifting left, and it's this idea of finding and fixing vulnerabilities earlier in the development process, because doing security retroactively is a pain. Fixing things that are already built insecurely, it's a pain. We want to catch it as quickly as possible, as early as possible, and have this secure design um, at the forefront. So it's this approach of building security in the development and operational processes really early. Um, all right, moving on. So what's DevSecOps? Okay, it's another trendy name for sure. It's been thrown around a bunch. There's DevSecOps, DevOpsSec, all sorts of combinations, but it's this idea of introducing the concept of security at every phase of the DevOps lifecycle. So moving to DevSecOps is honestly, it's a strategic, um, it's strategic and it allows for continual improvement process for continuing to deliver uh, secure processes. Uh, it allows for increased efficiency, product quality, uh, allowed, allows for like enhanced compliance, and also it invites collaboration. It's this idea of, all right, how do we how do we improve this process? How do we make sure that security is part of this process at every step of the way? And again, it's this like it's an ongoing process for sure. And something that I really do want to stress is the benefits of Dev DevSecOps extends to the entire organization. Um, this isn't just something that will benefit a software, like a software development team or just like one security team. This is something that will extend beyond the team, beyond a project. It's very much helping with creating this culture of security and making sure that security is part of the conversation from the get-go. And ultimately, the big, the big final line is focusing on security really helps the business and its customers. It allows for like increased productivity, increased security. So it's like a win-win for everyone. But it's definitely important to make sure that it's part of the conversation. And this is something that, you know, will continue being a trend for sure. All right. So what are CICD pipelines? Um, CID, CICD stands for continuous integration, continuous deployment. It's This is just the entirety of the DevOps pipeline. Um, and each pipeline is kind of dedicated to a specific process or produces a um, some specific application. And there isn't a like standard, I would say, for CICD pipelines. It's very much what works best. Um, there's a whole array of tools, um, processes, ways to go about it. So again, there's no one, one size fits all, but it's just one of many. Um, I also want to call out that you know, attacking and exploiting CICD pipelines is definitely something to be cognizant of. Um, some things that could be threats to CICD pipelines in general is, you know, making someone trying to make an unauthorized commit to master, executing something um, without authorization, that sort of thing. So definitely something that is vulnerable, if not set up securely. Cloud security, another, another easy, quick topic. But basically, cloud security has been around for a while. I think in general, uh, there's a good understanding of, of its importance. There's a ton of different cloud platforms out there. And I want to emphasize that, you know, good cloud security, good application security starts out in um, development. There is a lot of risk in misconfiguring cloud environments. It's something that should be taken really seriously because there is, there had been this idea of, you know, you're, you're giving, uh, you're using other resources, like you're using different cloud platforms. In this case, throughout the rest of this talk, we're going to be talking about AWS, but it's, you think that you're shifting your ownership to another platform, but in reality, configuring your, your cloud environment is really important. And yeah, when it comes to securing uh, a cloud environment, you really want to think about shifting left, um, automated, there's a lot of room for including automated tools and making sure that you could you could you you could log everything um, in your cloud environment. You could also have scanning set up. Lots of great things that we'll continue to talk about over here. But yeah, it's definitely this idea of the shared responsibility model that's super important. And I would also want to emphasize that visibility uh, into your cloud environment is very important. All right, what are containers? Containers are really great. Um, they're light, they're easy, they're quicker than virtual machines. You could spin them up, spin them down. Docker, um, 
is really popular. But I also want to point out that containers are pretty notorious for having security vulnerabilities. Um, base images that base images, which are just containers that you could pull from public repositories, could be malicious or not built with security in mind. So again, they're really helpful for development. They're really great for setting up a quick environment, testing something, knocking them down, but um, making sure that the image you're using, uh, you're baselining it to be secure from the get-go as well. All right, open source. Another, another thing in general in information technology that we should be pretty familiar with is just this idea of uh, you know, open source software that's released under a license that allows folks to be able to use it freely. There's a lot of con uh, pros, for instance, you know, it's free. Um, there's usually some improvements. You have access to the source code. You could um, customize it further from there. You could also scale it pretty well. Um, there's usually a community behind different open source tools, but cons are, um, there is a potential that it could go away in the future. Uh, funding open source is kind of tricky. It, it requires community funding. Um, also customer support isn't always reliable, but, and also like security is also a big question. It's a big swim at your own risk sort of thing, but open source is really great. Being familiar with open source tools is really important. And I would also wanna emphasize having exposure to open source and enterprise tools is really critical. So definitely something I took in mind when I was coming up with this talk and then, Let's talk. So let's let's actually bring it back to this floating the go. Where did this name even come from? So OWASP WebGo. So OWASP is the Open Worldwide Application Security Project. It's a nonprofit, and they work to improve the security of software. Um, they have a ton of great programs, including like chapters, projects, conferences. They have a ton of open source tools. Um, I'm going to be talking about a couple today. And yeah, they're really great. So they have this tool called WebGo. WebGo, actually the purpose of this application is it's meant to be a intentionally vulnerable application that allows folks to learn how to test and look for security vulnerabilities in a Java-based application. Um, I really love this tool. I think it's a really great tool to learn how to pen test, how to become familiar with the OAS top 10 vulnerabilities. And also I was thinking about what if, what if I used OWASP WebGo and tried to build a like CICD pipeline around it? What would that look like? What could I use? What free tools are there? How, what like cloud platform could I use? So that was the beginning of coming up with all this. It's this idea of being like, okay, so there is this application. It's meant to be insecure. I could pull it up on a, on a container and let me see if I could like use some tooling, some free, some enterprise to make it more secure. All right, so what, what could this even look like? Like what would securing the pipeline from end to end even look like? And I wanna call out, this is meant to be like a really like idealized and super mature DevSecOps end to end pipeline. Um, I wanna call out, is this realistic for everyone? No, not really, but I think this is a solid a solid thing to aspire towards. I think this is a good thing to build off of. And there's also a lot of things that aren't included in this. Um, for the purpose of this talk, I just limited to, you know, the start with, with a new feature, some security architecture and design, threat modeling, some scanning, third-party component scanning, repo scanning, pen testing, approval, and then this continuous logging and monitoring. So again, this is just something you could jump off of, you could add plenty to, you could eliminate from. And for the purpose of this talk, I'm actually gonna focus on only a couple of things in this pipeline. But yeah, there's some things I also wanna call out um, that I also didn't include. Some There's also a bunch of important topics like secrets management, infrastructure as code, policy as code, um, things that are good to include. And also not all of these things in this pipeline are automated processes. Some of these are manual and we're actually going to start with a manual process right away with the security architecture in design. So yeah, um, starting out with this manual talk, um, man sorry, manual part, I was like, okay, so I know I want to use OWASP WebGo. I think I want to maybe use AWS and AWS. I know there's like an EC2 instance I can probably utilize. So let's, let's like start thinking through what the design of this could even look like. 
Um, what's really important during the security architecture and design phase is talking through um, different components, looking at setup, looking at requirements, and creating a preliminary web architecture diagram that you could leverage the threat model off of, which would be the following step. So going back to OWASP WebGo, just wanted to include some screenshots of it off the OWASP website. Um, again, as I mentioned, the purpose of this application is to learn how to hack, stop, stop attacks. Um, and also it gives, there's more explanation on GitHub. There's an introduction. And also they have a really detailed um, installation instructions on how you can run it using um, Docker. All right, so this is my preliminary um, web architecture diagram. So we got our web browser client over here. So this is how we're interacting with OS WebGo. It's going to be on an EC2 instance is kind of what I'm thinking. We're going to have a backend database and we're going to have these insecure HTTP response and requests back and forth between the two. So now that we have our web app architecture diagram, we can move on to the next step of threat modeling. Again, another manual process, but there are a bunch of great tools um, you could use when you're threat modeling. OWASP actually has a, another project called Threat Dragon. Um, I'll talk about it a little bit more in the next slides. But before we talk about Threat Dragon, I also want to talk about what are some things that you should consider when you're threat modeling. So we have a web architecture diagram, awesome. What can, like, what should we be looking at when we're looking at this web architecture diagram? Um, let's think about what could, what are the threats at play here? What are the risks? What What is even like the attack surface? Um, are there any tools that we're using that have any known vulnerabilities? Um, those sort of things are these, these are the types of questions that you should be thinking through when you're threat modeling. And I also want to call out a really great thing to consider when you're threat modeling is making sure that you might have like a peer or someone, um, a colleague that you could bounce these ideas off of because threat modeling is again, it's not an exhaustive process, but I do think it's really important to get someone else's perspective because there's definitely things that you can miss when you're going ahead with it. So about OS Threat Dragon, yeah, it's a free open source cross-platform application. You could download it, it has a GUI. Um, and again, there's more information on it on OWASP.com. <laughs> um, but yeah, so the way that, hold on, what's, yeah, so OWASP Threat Dragon, it already has a threat, dra or, um, a threat modeling uh, framework on it called Stride, and Stride basically looks at um, looks at it from this perspective of spoofing, tampering, repudiation, um, information di disclosure, and elevation of privilege. So when we're threat modeling, those are the threats that we have in mind when we're working through it. Again, included some details on just how to install it um, and information on the GitHub as well. So back to um, Stride, again, super helpful. Um, what it also, so you have the GUI, you're, you have, you could, um, you could upload your web architecture diagram on it. You could label different assets and it goes ahead and produces this um, PDF, which could be really handy, something you could reference going forward, but you have this um, PDF that includes an executive summary, a high level, description, it goes through total threats, total mitigated, open threats, and goes through different um, vectors to look at. So super handy. Um, I called out like the browser being, I called out the browser, I called out the EC2 instance, and it comes out in a PDF that after you're done threat modeling, it comes out super handy. And then from there, this is this is what the output, I just basically took what the PDF um, gave out and put it on a slide. So this is what the PDF gave me. Um, so when it comes to the web browser, when it comes to the EC2 instance, I should be concerned about spoofing. Um, additionally, with the ECD, 
EC2 instance, I should also be concerned about repudiation and the fact that I'm using HTTP responses. Definitely there's a um, threat of information disclosure and similarly with the EC2 instance threat of tampering. So from there, we have little descriptions on what spoofing is, what information disclosure is, what's tampering. And then on this column over here, we have uh, different mitigations for all those things. So making sure that we have authentication in place by using application scanning, making sure that we have auditing and logging in place by using um, a logging tool like CloudWatch, which is built on uh, AWS. So going on, this is our original um, architecture diagram. And then this is what it looks like with um, our mitigations in place, making sure that we have CloudWatch for logging and also application scanning using Zap. And I'll talk a little bit more about these things as we go ahead. Ooh, we have a question in the chat, Chloe, from Varsha. Yes, yes, yes. yes. What are the different roles that are involved in threat modeling? And when they say roles, I, it might be like different types of jobs or people that should be there, but you huh. can interpret the question however you want. Yeah, great question. Um, different roles. I would say what's involved is, you know, you're looking, you're a security architect, you're looking at a, like a web architecture and you're kind of working through what, what are the crown jewels, what are the threats involved and what could mitigations look like. Um, different roles itself on a team would be just, I would say like security architects, senior architects, um, and different folks who would be looking at a web architecture diagram and working through those questions. I don't know if that's really a great answer to that, honestly, but. I mean, um, it's your answer. And yeah. one thing I've learned about threat modeling, especially after attending threat mod con is that everyone does it kind of differently yeah. and who's invited and who did which part, like some companies they're like, oh, the developers have to do the whole thing and mm -hmm. other companies it's only security folks. And so we want your experience. So thank you. Yeah. No, for sure. For sure. And I think different perspectives is really important. I mentioned the idea of using a peer and having another security architect looking at your threat model and be like, hey, what about this? What about this? How How is the data being moved? Who has access? Being able to have discourse, being able to talk through um, an architecture diagram and talk about what you think the, the threats are and whether there's anything else is really important. Um, as Tanya said, there are there is like no one way to do it. There's a ton of different frameworks you could use. There's MITRE ATT&CK, there's um, STRIDE, tons of different ways to look at it for sure. And yeah. Cool. Thank you very much. Oh, for sure. For sure. All right. So back to our, um, our pipeline. So at this point, we kind of moved through this like ideation phase, this all like early, early development stuff. Oh yeah. Pasta is also really great. Is another framework um, where we have this idea of a new feature I'm working through like, okay, I know I want to use this. I know I want to use that. We have security. So we went through like what architecture and design would look like and then performing threat modeling on that architecture and design. So from here, we could consider this like continuous, what would the continuous integration, continuous delivery be? And a lot of this involves code scanning, automated tests, just a lot of scanning to make sure that what you've created is secure. Um, so going back to my the threat model, we identify different challenges and risks. So there's security flaws in the design and architecture of the of the application or else WebGo is meant to be insecure. So by virtue of that, there are like that's a risk for sure. Um, you know, there's also a concern of like the slow and inefficient and insecure deployment. Um just by virtue of like not having anything automated yet. You're just setting everything up really monolithically. Uh, goes back to point one with this idea of these security flaws that are already in the source code. And then there's like this lack of visibility of like, there's no there's no logs set up. You don't really have an idea of if someone does try to exploit this vulnerable web application, what's going on and have any additional information. So 
with these identified challenges and risks, we have a bunch of different processes we could use to mitigate risk. So we we performed um, security architecture and design. We tried to build some, build something that's more secure. We threat modeled. And then from there, we could include some dynamic application scanning and try to configure some continuous logging and monitoring. So our wins would be making sure that we have a secure architecture and design process. We have an automated pipeline, we have automated security testing, and then we have continuous logging and monitoring. So I wanna call out that making sure that you have some wins, whether they're quick, whether they're more um, overarching is really important. Um, and also, again, this isn't this isn't it. There, there's a lot more you could include. There's a lot more you could add onto. And I wanna really emphasize the fact that this is really iterative. Uh, and super important. So for the the sake the sake of today, I'm just really going to focus on as I already went through the security architecture and design, threat modeling, DAST, and then this continuous logging and monitoring, and try to figure out what like what that even looks like. I just went through. All right. So diving into the demo. Um, as I mentioned before, with the funky name, wanted to make sure that we connected it back to the goats. This was like an old meme of um, goats licking salt walls, and it's actually a, a real thing. But yeah, so let's talk about what setting up the development environment would even look like. So as I called out earlier, and I have on the web architecture diagram, I wanted to use AWS. So some steps this would involve would be, um, setting up an AWS account, creating an EC2 instance. We got some default settings, default uh, VPC, no IM group. We want to allow all TCP access, launch instance, and then we could connect via SSH or EC2 user. I do want to call out all these steps, having you know no IM group, having the default settings, default VPC. That's also pretty insecure. But from there, we're going to work on adding more security. Um, and then once we connect to our EC2 instance, we want to install Docker, we want to start it. And from there, we want to pull the Docker WebGo image. Um, and once you are able, once it's installed, once it's up and running, you could confirm access by curling um, your local host. And from there on your, um, on your machine, you could go to access WebGo and see if it's up and running. And just showing a screenshot of setting up the development environment. This is AWS, we're on EC2 and we're pulling up a different instance. And then this is what it would look like when WebGo is already up. So you, you've you created the EC2 instance, you've downloaded Docker on it, you pulled the WebGo image, it's up and you're able to access WebGo locally. Um, and also, you know, again, it's insecure, that's the point. Um, the browser is also calling that out. So that's that's what you should be looking at once your web goat is up. And then I also included a screenshot of like, this is what the remainder of the application looks like. So again, um, if you want to replicate this yourself, if you want to try to create like a DevSecOps pilot, pilot, or if you even want to just get comfortable with hacking, this is a really great um, tool to work off of. All right, so we got that up. Let's talk about what um, DAS is gonna look like. Um, so yeah, in order to do all this, you also have to set up a GitLab server. Um, these are kind of just like some backend um, things that you also have to do to set up the development environment. So setting up and using a GitLab server, um, basically you wanna make sure that um, you could install and configure with the necessary dependencies, and then you could add the GitLab package repository and install the package. So this is something that you would have to do as well before you could go ahead with DAST, which is like an automated um, tool, and it's just something that the GitLab server will be able to assist with. Okay, so let's talk about automation. So Another really great OWASP tool, and actually um, this is a little out of date at this point, it's no longer an OWASP tool, it used to be, um, but as of this summer, they've moved off to be an independent project, but it's this um, tool called ZAP, which stands for Z Attack Proxy. 
Um, it's a really popular web app scanner. It's free and open source. It's actively maintained by a dedicated internal team of volunteers and they're on. And yeah, it's something you could install locally on your GUI. So to authenticate to web, um, you want to authenticate to web application scans to use Zap. So once we have we have our EC2 instance, we have the GitLab server up, we want to also access Zap. So once you have Zap installed locally on your computer, um, you basically have to configure it so that it is looking at WebGo. Um, the way to do that is you go to your se session properties and add the URL. And then from there, you also need, before you could even like get the scan scanning to be automated, you need to record a Zest script for authentication because this is something that could really trip you up where you're like oh no like i've set up my scanning to be automated but it's not working it can't it can't be automated until it's authenticated so you need to create as or you need to rather record a zest script so that it records how to authenticate into the application and then we could talk about what um automating the scans with zap would look like so you want to install um you want to install Zap on your terminal and create a script to automate scans um, with the Zap API. And from there, your next steps would be triggering an automated scan as part of the acceptance test, running the CICD pipeline, and reviewing results. Um, and once you get the results from Zap scanning, WebGo, you know, the OWASP top 10 should be coming up. Flaws built into the source code should come up as well. And reviewing, actually reviewing results from a scan, even though the scan itself is automated, is actually a manual. It, it's a manual process. You could further automate it by creating different like credential or um, metrics to look at where it's like, oh, I'm only looking at critical um, findings or that sort of thing. So that's something you could also continue to work through. All right, so once we have DAST set up and automated, we could talk about what continuous logging and monitoring would look like. So um, all cloud providers usually provide some level of monitoring. Um, there's a lot of built-in tools. There's basics are usually free, but any further configuration, any amount, any level or degree that you want something scanned does cost extra. Um, but it has a lot of great capabilities, including like metrics and graphs, logging, um, more automated stuff. And when it comes to AWS, they have something called AdWatch. So yeah, going into the configuration, we're gonna talk about CloudWatch. Again, CloudWatch is already offered in AWS. So what we would do is we would connect to the instance and run those following commands to make sure that um, it's set up. But I also want to call out that making sure that um, your IAM profile is set up correctly, you need to have this permission allow all so that you can make sure that um, CloudWatch is monitoring your EC2 instance with WebGo. From there, including some more steps on what um, the configuration would look like. Yeah, so bringing it all together, we have, we walk through what like the ideation would look like with security architecture and design, threat modeling. We talked about what this continuous, the CICD would look like with um, dynamic application scanning. And then we also talk about what logging could look like, what tools we could use and how to set that up and configure that. Um, additionally, you need to connect the GitLab server to automated scans and continuous logging. So with the GitLab server EC2 instance up, um, you could go ahead and configure GitLab runner. From there, you would inst install the runner on the EC2 instance. You would create an AWS IAM role, and then you would install and configure Zap on the WebGo EC2 instance and create Zap scanning scripts using the API. And then you would configure the GitLab CICD pipeline, the server with the WebGo code repo creates um, this file to define the pipeline. You would register the EC2 instance as 
GitLab runner, and then you would test the setup. So by testing it, you would be able to confirm that everything has been set up correctly and it's automated. You would push changes to the web applications repo to trigger the pipeline. The pipeline should perform the automated scanning and then send logs to CloudWatch. And as I mentioned before, CloudWatch has a ton of different things it offers, including graphs, um, all these different visualizations. So you could have idea, have a better sense of what's going on and assist with definitely that visibility issue. And then bring it all together. So we went through all these different um, parts of the CID, CICD pipeline where we we're talking about ideation, um, automated scanning, automated logging, and what would some like, what would continuous improvement and even lessons learned continue to be and look like? Um, definitely think it's important when it comes to Okay, great question. I'll get to that momentarily. Um, definitely some right away lessons learned is making sure that you buffer in more time for troubleshooting. Lots of things could come up, especially when you don't anticipate it. Um, as I've called out multiple times, the pipeline is definitely not exhaustive. There's more to add. Um, you could threat model and focus in on different aspects of a um, of an architecture diagram and focus on that. Um, I got a I got a question in the chat on how often are DAS scans performed on this timeline? It definitely depends. Um, this is another configuration thing that is a question to what is your preference? What, what is the business needs? Um, and also just cost in general. Um, and when I say cost, I mean, the uh, there's a lot of enterprise tools where they do they do charge per, per scan, per X amount of projects. Um, in this case, because we do have um, a free tool, I think I also mean cost and time for sure. Reviewing, um, seeing, you know, for something like this, I wouldn't necessarily need to scan this application more than once before, um, more than once, more than twice. Um, so it's definitely like a customization and configuration thing that's up to um, you. Yeah, it depends is a very common answer. It's an annoying answer, but it really genuinely does depend. Um, let's see. So continuing ahead with like next steps and more, more things you can include. So for AWS, definitely locking down security groups, inbound rules would be next things I would consider. I am rules, having a more restrictive VPC. Uh, you could also consider using Elastic Beanstalk, um, cloud formation to trigger setup, billing alerts. There's just, again, there's so much more you could add. This is just like a baseline. This is something very true or like sizable, but like also manageable to work off of. Um, with WebGo, I could also focus on the automation to target the OWASP top 10 and these third-party components. I could also like, I use OWASP WebGo. There's a ton of other web, like vulnerable web application tools like OWASP Juice, OWASP, Juice Shop, um, AWS, Go, Damn Vulnerable Web App. And on, you could also try to use different cloud platforms like Azure and GCP. And then our beyond is, you know, I mentioned there's also other things like policy as code, secrets management, third-party component scanning. Obviously, I have to throw out AI because it's not 2023 if we don't even mention AI in a single talk um, and how it could relate. Uh, but yeah, that is all I have. Does anyone have any questions, anything that they would want to like go into in more depth? Oh, so someone asked anonymously, um, how about integrating software composition analysis into the CI CD? Is that something we could do? I would think so. It's not something I could speak up, speak to in greater depth, but I could I could imagine that would be the case. Can I, can I answer and be yeah, annoying? Yeah, please, please go ahead. SCA is a great check for the pipeline because it's so fast. It's just a cross reference of like if you're doing .NET, you get the CS proj file, and it's just like a list of all your NuGet packages or whatever your libraries are, and then it's like are any of those versions ones we know are bad? It's so fast, Chloe. Um, from there, you have to decide, okay, so is it reachable, et cetera, et cetera. But no, you can know like right away if you have packages that have vulnerabilities in them. So totally do it. 
And there's, there is one from OWASP, dependency check. If you're going to do it manually and dependency track, if you're going to do it in a CI CD. Yay, Steve and Jeremiah. <laughs> um, awesome. Chloe, I have questions. Yes. So while everyone's putting their questions into the chat, if someone wanted, so they want to get started with DevSecOps and they just like do not know where to start, where's a good place for them to start? Uh, yeah, definitely great question. Um, there is honestly an overwhelming amount of information, which is a good problem to have in comparison to several years ago. Um, there's a lot of great, there's a lot of great resources online. I would say the way I approached it is let's, let's try to build, like, let's try to break it down to the most manageable pieces. Like I knew I wanted to use WebGo. I knew I wanted to use AWS and I had an idea of what, a DevSecOps pipeline would look like. And I was like, okay, what for the purpose of this makes sense for me to focus on? I want to get more comfortable with AWS or I want to get more comfortable with setting up automated scanning and I want to figure out how to even configure um, logging. So that's how I approached it. And I came to that conclusion after I came up with a web architecture diagram and I threat modeled. So I really think that the best approach is having an having a vague idea, researching into the vague idea creating a architecture diagram and threat modeling off of that. Threat modeling does a really good job nudging some things to the surface that you can't quite think through when you're first coming up with like a proof of concept or a different idea or like a different pilot or like sandbox you want to come up with. Um, and then from there leaning into what, you know, risks, what are the big glaring risks that come out of threat modeling and automate and build security around that. Cool. Okay, so I have more questions. Yeah. <laughs> so you're a security architect, and I, I'm trying to think of how to word this question, but so lots of people want to become a security architect someday. Can you, mm -hmm. like, I know this is totally off topic, but could you tell us briefly, like, how you did that? <laughs> because, oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> um, uh... Yeah, honestly, I started out with in security architecture with not a lot of security architecture um, experience. I had never done that previously, um, but it's very learnable. It's a really great skill set to learn, and it's a really great way. Like, I'm so grateful for having experience in security architecture because it helps inform all my work. It helps inform um, any risk related decision I make when it comes to security. So I would say it's definitely a mindset. It's definitely a skill that you could work on. And also there's no one right answer. Uh, looking, you could look at any diagram and see something that's very glaring. You can miss other things. So it's definitely something that is very learnable. I really want to stress that. And it's a really great, it's a really great thing to add to your arsenal as a security professional. Um, to get more comfortable, I just got real, I just became really familiar with different um, threat modeling frameworks like threat, um, MITRE attack, stride, pasta. There's a ton of different, um, threat modeling frameworks that you could work off of and getting comfortable with, um, looking through the different risks is really great. And it helped increase my familiarity. Cool. How, so what types of job, so i I know I'm asking a lot of questions. Oh, Varsha has a question. Varsha, do you want to unmute and ask your question? I don't know if you can do that, but try. And if not, then you're going to need to put it in the Q&A. Yeah, I see you. And I don't know how to make you speakable. Just a second. Let me see. Allow to talk. There you go. Um. Hi. Uh, thank you for doing that. Um. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Oh, yeah. So I have a question about uh, SCA. I understand that you can do it in the CI CD pipeline. And I have uh, seen in places, you know, it is also done for container images. So I uh, don't understand the difference uh, between these two. You know, are these both required? Or you can do one of uh, these, like doing it uh, directly on the, you know, your uh, uh, libraries which are included in the CI CD pipeline or for the containers. Uh, did I make sense? You totally made sense. I okay. So I find this confusing too, where like a software composition analysis product is supposed to do like 
custom software, like software your team's building. Mm -hmm. um, whereas then there's also like, it checks dependencies and vulnerabilities in them in containers, but it's like a different functionality. And then they're calling it SCA. I'm like, why would you give it the same name? <laughs> it does a different thing. Um, Chloe, do you have any thoughts on that? I personally find that very confusing. No, I, I think that pretty pretty much covered it. So, so you do need to do, but like if you're doing containers, you do need to check the dependencies in the container for yes. vulnerabilities. And then you need to decide, is that vulnerability that's in your dependency? Like, is it reachable? Is it exploitable? Like, am I worried about it? versus and and that's a lot harder in a container than it is in custom software because with custom software there are tools out there and I'm super biased because some grab sells one um so super biased <laughs> alert. but basically like they'll track if it's reachable in your code so like a library will have like 500 functions and then you might not be calling the function that has the scary vulnerability in it so if you're not calling it you're usually good but if you are calling it you're usually in trouble. Um, and so it's like, well, if you're calling one of the other 499, like, do you need to freak out? Probably not. Oh, Durga's adding to the conversation. Container scanning are more about underlying base image used and against the dependencies in your Docker file or the code you push as part of the build process. So it's more like, from what I understand, it's infrastructure related, and it's usually a different tool that you use to check that. Um, so for instance, Checkmarks has something called Kix um, that will check your infrastructure, like base image. And if basically you have scary settings or good settings, if you have like everything patched and up to date, same with um, Checkoff from Prisma Cloud, which are both free. Yeah, Trivi, there's lots of paid ones too. Um, and then the checking those dependencies is sort of like an extra add on to that, if that makes sense. Sorry to like answer all your questions, Chloe. No, no, so I appreciate it. <laughs> I just have one more question uh, about the same topic. So uh, what do you do with these, uh, you know, libraries which are being used in the local environment of um, developers? How, is there any tool for that? Something like SCA? Sorry. Uh, so um, these, these libraries are also used in the local environments for developers, right? Mm -hmm. So how do you manage it there in CI/CD? You can uh, basically uh, check for uh, you know these out of date or vulnerable packages. How do you do it in a local environment? Durga's answering in the chat, so I feel almost like we should bring Durga on. Um, and Durga's saying basically like you can have an IDE plugin that does this that will tell you like hey like you've got like these twenty two libraries and like these four are like mm, kind of kind of shady, I don't know. Um, you can also just point it to your code repository, a software composition analysis tool. So like every time you check it in, it tells you, hey, you just add this library and it's pretty sketch. I don't know about your decisions today. Um, then you can also have like a weekly scan where it sends you an email and it tells you like all the ones where like libraries are disconcerting. Then you could also like, if you have an SCA tool, go in the portal and then you could see like, if you're an AppSec person, see like every single thing that's there. I see. Cool. Thank yeah. you, Varsha. Yeah, thank you so much. Great question. Oh, Especially it just underscores the importance of making sure that you're, you know, scanning everything locally, scanning any third parties, scanning any dependencies and having a good awareness of and a good amount of visibility around that. Yeah. Okay, Chloe, I have like one more question. Yeah. So yeah. Okay, so what types of job experience did you have that led you to be able to become a security architect? Yeah, no, great question. Um, I started my career at Deloitte as a cyber risk consultant. Basically, I was thrown on a bunch of different projects with not a lot of context going into it. Risk, um, think risk assessments, vulnerability management, pen testing, application security. And I just got really comfortable by virtue of just being a consultant. I got really comfortable with not really being familiar with this new tool or this new team and jumping in and getting up to speed really quickly. So I think the skill of just being able to jump into things, getting comfortable learning as much as possible, um, really translated well to doing security architecture and also 
developing that mindset of, you know, being comfortable with the unfamiliar, getting more familiar with it and gaining a better understanding. Okay, I have one more question. Yeah, 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 no. (laughs) I'm so curious about people's journey and how they got to where they are because like I had a really weird journey to get to where I was. And so there's no tradition, it's not like, when you become an accountant, you go to university, you take accounting, then you do the special exam and then boom, you're an accountant, right? Like it's not like that with cyber. So then how did, so how did you get that first job at Deloitte? Because that sounds like a magical place where you got to learn basically everything. (laughs) How did you get, how'd you break in there? Yeah, I would say definitely, I would, I would say the, my way into cyber on the spectrum of funny ways into this industry was probably more on the traditional side. I studied information systems in an undergrad business school and consulting made a lot of sense, especially cyber risk consulting. It was very much the mix between business, professional services, and cybersecurity. And from there, um, got comfortable with all different types of tools, different types of security. And also I had clients in all these different industries where I was able to look at risk from all these different perspectives. And I really enjoyed it. Um, You know, from there, I got my CISSP. And then I decided to move over to another company and start out doing security architecture. And now I'm working doing security um, endpoint. But I want to call out, as exactly you said, Tanya, there's no like traditional path in cyber. And I also want to call out that every company does cyber very, very differently. The The spectrum of maturity is really, really varied. There's teams that do like enterprise level security for, you know, global companies, but um, there are teams where it's like, um, you know, one of a couple folks who are devoted to all of security or... So yeah, that's just something I want to call out. I think it's really interesting in our industry because as a software developer, it's kind of understood that there's, you know, X amount per company versus cyber. It's a little more varied for sure. Okay. So that was such a good answer. (laughs) Thank you. I felt like it was a really encouraging answer too. Um, Because sometimes like when people tell us the story, it's like, oh, that was so hard. I could never do that. But that was like, yeah, that that was a lot of work, but I see like that's definitely doable. Yeah, um, yeah, definitely a lot of work, but definitely doable. So the next question, so we have to wrap up, We're running out of time. Tanya's bad saying goodbye. Um, where can people get more Chloe? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn. I keep my LinkedIn more active than my personal website. I have a GitHub on my GitHub. I have the slides um, to this talk. So if you want to go look at the slides again, I could throw that link in there as well. Um, but yeah, feel free to add me on LinkedIn. I'm always happy to chat with folks, meet d- different folks and yeah, clearly love talking about this stuff. So excited to definitely connect with all of you. Awesome. I am like trying to find your GitHub account really quickly, but it's not working. Um, so you also have a personal website can we, can we share that? Yeah, maybe? yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so people can see you. So we need to say it out loud because not everyone's going to be able to see the chat when they hear the recording later. And then they're going to be like, what is her personal website? All right. Yeah, potsgland.com, LinkedIn. You could look up Potsgland as well. Um, and GitHub, you could just look up um, GitHub floating the go and it should come up right away. Awesome. Thank <laughs> you so much. This has been really great. Um, Thank you, Leila, my co-host. And thank you, Chloe. This has been just wonderful. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me. So excited to be here for sure. And thank you, audience. Thank you, SunGrab community members for showing up. We really appreciate it. We just started doing events this month and it's just been so awesome to see like just how many people are showing up for like our first couple of sessions. Next month, we are doing a session with Nathan Case called Down with the CISO. And he's a CISO. So it's it's not a negative. It's, it's not a negative statement. Um, oh, you came from Mighty Networks. Thank you for coming from We Hack Purple. Um, okay, well, Chloe, thank you so much. And I hope to see you again, probably at Diana, if not earlier. Yeah, um, for sure. <laughs> okay, well, I suck at saying goodbye. So um, thank you, everyone. And we will see you next time. Bye. Bye.